Why Study Theology by Donald G. Luck, starting with Chapter 1. Why Complicate Things? Even though students take up the task of theology, it doesn't mean they do so willingly. Many times it is the result of having to fulfill a requirement in the curriculum of a college, university, or seminary, not personal interest or enthusiasm. And perhaps that is the very reason you are reading this book right now. It's a requirement. Let me see if I can meet you, some of you where you are by identifying and speaking to some objections to theology that I have encountered in my teaching career. And see if I provide a helpful response to some or all of these objections. Even if my responses do not necessarily eliminate these objections, see if they can, to a degree, moderate some of them. If so, I will not only be talking about theology, I will be demonstrating how to do theology. I will be presenting arguments, making cases, and seeing if what I am pointing to doesn't make sense. That is central to the theological task. When I say I here, it refers to more than private opinion. It will reflect my dependence on and participation in a community of disciplined inquiry and reflection that is active now and has been in the past. This is also part of the theological task. More will be said about this later. Let's turn now to some common objections that people have to theology. All we need is the Bible. Without question, the Bible has a special place in the Christian community, especially for Protestants who, from the time of the Reformation, have appealed to it as the fundamental authority for life and thought. Millions seek inspiration and guidance from its pages, and even theologians themselves appeal to Scripture to substantiate their arguments. Scripture is the bedrock on which the Church builds its life and witness, since it is the closest we can get to the experiences that we that were understood to be communications of the presence, nature, and will of God. Central to Christians are the life and ministry of Jesus, and the history of the people of Jesus that established the background and living context in which Jesus functioned. Our access to these experiences is through literature that reflects or directly points to them. Therefore, many are persuaded that the enterprise of the theology is unnecessary. People need only the scriptures and a believing heart, and they will understand clearly God's will for their lives and God's work to the world. For example, Martin Luther made statements to the effect that the most humble peasant reading the Bible can more clearly understand what the gospel is, and the learned university professor whom the papacy quoted. But it's not that simple. In the first place, Luther himself was a learned university professor. He was a student of scripture who made it a point to read the ancient writings in the original Hebrew and Greek in order to understand their meaning better, and he soon discovered that he had deep and sometimes bitter disagreements with others who equally appealed to scripture as the authority for their arguments. These included those who cited the Bible in denying the validity of infant baptism, and those who argued for the possibility of Christianizing the political realm, views that differed from Luther's. The point is, no one, university pref professor or peasant or we, ever reads the Bible in a vacuum, and because we do not, we don't always agree on what it is saying. The reading of scripture is as much shaped by the one who reads it as it is by what we read. We bring ourselves, our assumptions, our interests, even our prejudices to what we read. That's why there is widespread acknowledgement that persons can find backing for almost any opinion within the pages of the Bible. We have to admit the possibility that while we believe we are reading something out of Scripture, we can actually be reading something into it. The technical terms for these two alternatives are exegesis and asegesis, respectively. If the church is going to appeal to scriptural authority, it needs to be it needs to use the best possible resources for understanding. The two assemblages of various writings that have been collectively called the book, Biblios in Greek, or the writings, Scriptura in Latin. Accordingly, biblical scholars work hard at analyzing these writings in terms of both their historical and cultural settings, and their features as forms of literature. But even this helpful and necessary scholarly work doesn't deal with all the issues. Let's think for a moment how Christians unconsciously evaluate and prioritize biblical materials. They do this so automatically that it slips by their notice, but it shouldn't. They need to stop and ask themselves what sort of criteria operate for them when they respond to various pages of scripture as they do. Even fundamentalists who claim the entire Bible is not only inspired by God, but actually infallible, that is, without error, don't actually operate as if every segment of scripture is equal value. In a lengthy section of Exodus, chapters 25 through 40, for example, there are detailed descriptions of the materials and patterns for the ark and tabernacles used in Exodus's 
in Israel's Exodus wanderings. In only a few verses of chapter 5 of Amos, on the other hand, the prophet cites God's insistence that sacred ceremonies and offerings are unimportant. What God prefers, Amos argues, is committed to justice and integrity. Almost everyone would probably assume that the later reference, though much briefer, is more important than the former. But why? What are readers presupposing? Selective emphasis and prioritizing is always at work, even among those who believe they are centrally dependent on Scripture. To cite Luther again as an example, even though he insisted that the Scripture is the foundation of Christian life and faith, it's instructive to note that he dismissed entire books of the Bible because he thought they had little value. He mused that the Bible is the manger in which the Christ child is to be found, and Christians are to worship, not the Bible, but the Christ it contains. Perhaps he had this metaphor in mind when he called the epistle of James an epistle of straw, since, to his way of thinking, it doesn't understand the gospel of grace as well as the writing is of Paul. And he said that the book of Esther could be well be left out of the Bible, since it doesn't even mention God once. And as for the book of Revelation, he argued its cryptic language lends itself to the harebrained interpretations of crackpots. So, we would have been better off following the advice of the early Eastern Church and keeping it out of the canon. We all have implicit criteria, criteria that we use to evaluate and prioritize particular segments of Scripture. To follow up on Luther as an example, his central criterion was clear. The Scriptures, he said, are meant to drive us toward Christ, either in repentance or in radical trust. Furthermore, he argued, such a standard is not arbitrary since it reflects Paul's basic distinction between relation to God under the law and relation to God through the gospel. This is not the argue that Luther's views are undisputed, but it is to say that even someone who insisted that Scripture alone is final authority, sola scriptura, had to make arguments out of Scripture. Therefore, even if we might not agree with Luther's treatment of Scripture and the criteria he used, we should at least recognize that he was above board about his standards of judgment and that he provided arguments for the, their, their validity, and so should everyone else. But to do that is to do theology. Our unconscious assumptions also guide our interpretation of biblical materials. Consider the fact that both the Hebrew and Christian Scriptures assumes the givenness of slavery. Nowhere is there an outright repudiation of this institution. In fact, in several places, Ephesians 6, 5-9, Colossians 3, 20, and Titus 2, 9, slaves are encouraged to show obedience to those who own them. What should we make of that? But what about the regulations governing the sexual treatment of women captured in battle? Deuteronomy 21, verses 10-14. through 14. Do we consider them God's word for us? However we respond, we need to recognize that our interpretation is implicitly appealing to authorities and lines of argument beyond the pages of the Bible itself. Doing this is equivalent to doing theology. We usually aren't aware of these assumptions and appeals, but they shape the reading of Scripture profoundly. Being careful and faithful interpreters means coming clean and being held theologically accountable for the ways we read the Bible. We might be uncomfortable having to identify and justify our assumptions, and if we are not sure of ourselves, we may become defensive and pound pupils or attack the Christian identity of those who disagree with or question us. But our assumptions are exactly the issue. We certainly are relevant when we have to reconcile what seems to be outright internal contradictions. In Psalms 139, for example, the psalmist cries out, O oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God! Do I not hate those who hate you? O oh, Lord, and do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Verses 19 and 21 through 22. These words are biblical, but it is hard for us to believe that they would be found in the lips of the crucified Jesus, and they clash with the insistence in 1 John 4.20 that loving God and hating another person are totally incompatible, but harmonizing varying elements of Scripture means we have to rely on arguments that go beyond the Scriptures themselves. Such argumentation amounts to doing theology. There is also a problem reconciling certain elements of the Bible with what seems to be external contradictions, that is, with the growing bodies of knowledge about the natural world and human nature that emerge from the extensive investigations of science, because of its central appeal to the authority of Scripture. Protestant theology has been split more by this issue than by any other over the last two centuries. It remains a battlefield. For example, the Christians who oppose the teaching of evolution in public schools. 
because they believe it contradicts the clear teachings of the first two chapters in Genesis. But even Christians who are not fundamentalists have had to figure out what to do with these biblical accounts and how to relate them to the claims of science. Our assumptions are not self-evident or uncontested. Once we challenge to explain and justify them, we realize we have to do something very careful thinking and explaining, and this is precisely what doing theology means. This need for thoughtful examination, reflection, and explanation becomes even more obvious once we begin to examine Scripture closely. Careful reading unearths hidden problems. For example, look at Acts 2. New Testament scholars believe that the author was depending on very early materials here. Let's bracket out for a moment other New Testament materials, later Christian notions, and our automatic tendency to homogenize everything in the Bible as if everything were, were saying the same thing. If we then look carefully at what this text is saying on its own, what we find is rather startling. In verses 24 and 32, Jesus' resurrection is spoken of in the passive voice. Jesus did not rise, but was raised. Moreover, a distinction is made between Jesus and God, and it is God, not Jesus, who is the active agent. Yet later, Christian literature in the New Testament itself and in materials like the Apostles and Nicene's creeds speak of the Christ who rose on the third day, active voice. What do we make of this passive voice, particularly if it is early material? The puzzling problem deepens when we look closely at verse 36. Here it is asserted that in raising Jesus from the dead, God has made him both Lord and Messiah, italics added. Now, that is quite extraordinary. Long-standing Christian tradition has assumed that Jesus the Christ is the Christ from the moment he is conceived. But the material in Acts 2 presents a different picture. Jesus was faithful to God, and because of that obedience was put to death. But God vindicated him by raising him from the dead, and that this act exalted him and made him both Lord and Messiah. Again, the point is, whatever we make of these issues, we have to do some careful thinking and explaining. That amounts to doing theology. Finally, the need for theology becomes all the more pressing when the church has to discover what being faithful to Christ means in changing historical and cultural situations. How do we interpret scripture in regard to pressing contemporary issues? We've already noted that many biblical passages can be cited to support slavery. Accordingly, 19th century abolitionists had to do this, some very careful theological theologizing in the process also had to give reasons why they challenged the biblical grounded arguments of Christians who supported slavery. Today, churches face challenges to traditional notions about the nature and place of women, not only in society, but also in the church itself. The traditions of the social subordination of women and the specific exclusion of women from public leadership in the church appear to have strong biblical support just as slavery did. Examining these issues today, in light of Scripture, is also causing Scripture to be examined in the light of these issues. Some want to be set aside biblical passages that restrict the role of women as historically and cultural bound. Others believe they are timeless, but regardless of proponents of either position have to beyond, go beyond the Bible itself and provide cogent theological arguments. Yes. The Bible remains a central resource for the Christian community, and it has a fundamental authority. However, for that very reason, it makes theology necessary. If we really want to listen to the scriptures and let them have authority in the church, then we need to approach them carefully. We must understand them for what they are and make neither more or less of them than is warranted. We must let them speak on their own terms, not on the terms of our unjustified and questionable and eventually arbitrary assumptions. We need to engage in careful and informed thinking. We should simply trust the leading of the Spirit. There is another ob objection to theology that needs careful examination precisely because there is an important element of truth in it. It is the belief that more than anything else Christians should seek to have Jesus live in their hearts, focusing on straightening out ideas in their heads, it is argued, is the wrong emphasis. That is a valid caution. Life in God is not fundamentally a system of belief at all, much less a rational examination and explanation of belief. Rather, it is trust and love and commitment. Scriptures attest to that over and over again, and so do the broad reaches of Christian experience. The fact is, most of the time we are moved by the lives of Christian saints than we are by the arguments of Christian theologians, and believing Christians probably are more shaped by the worshiping and serving life of Christian congregations than by formal instruction.
Christian identity is centered in recognizing who God is and what God's meaning and will for our lives are. It is supremely true that we are claimed by nothing less than God's Spirit, which transforms and directs our life in the world. The only problem is, what Spirit is God's Spirit? Wide varieties of claims are made as to what it is and isn't. Sometimes it has been identified with sheer nonsense and embarrassing miscalculation, and other times there have been tragic, destructive results. Over the course of Christian history, all sorts of movements, which the wider wisdom of the time or the hindsight of subsequent years have shown to be mistaken, have claimed to be led by God's Spirit. Moved by the Spirit, Francis of Assisi is said to have preached to the birds. There is something charming about that, even if it doesn't necessarily help us discover the Spirit in our own lives. But we need to remember that claiming to be moved by the Spirit, church officials called for military crusades against Muslims and burned people at the stake. As Paul cautions, we need to test the Spirit's. We need God's grace to help us discern what is truly the expression of the Holy Spirit moving God's people and the currents of history and what isn't. We have to evaluate the enthusiasms and commitments that claim Christians. Part of the testing includes noticing their fruits. What results are there? And are these coherent with earlier Christian experience and especially with the life, the spirit that moved Jesus? But testing also entails making careful investigations and equally careful arguments. That's what occurred in the Confessing Church movement in Germany earlier in this century. It has challenged widespread enthusiasm in the churches for the outlook and spirit of the Nazis. It's hard for us to believe here and now that such an alien spirit could see so many pastors and church-going people, but it did. At the time, the horrors of war had not been felt and the concentration camps had not been built, but the spirit that built them was already evident. Against that enthusiasm, the members of Confessing Church mustered careful and vigorous theological arguments. They were a minority then and were swept aside, but their bold witness and equally careful arguments encouraged thousands of people to resist Nazi policies and ideas. This event in our own time demonstrates that one of the most important tests of what is and isn't of the Spirit is that of intelligibility. Paul himself refers to that test when writing about what to Today we call speaking in tongues. He notes that he himself had this special ability, which he believed was a gift of God's Spirit. But, he argues, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue, 1 Corinthians 14, 19. A sense of personal commitment and deep religious enthusiasm are not enough. Life in the Spirit may be more than theology, but it must make sense. It must be rationally coherent, and if we abandon that criterion, then we open the door to all sorts of aberrations, like the Nazis' theories of racial superiority and inferiority, or like the countless number of sects that keep springing up to claim that we are living in the end times. The fact is... We make rationally based judgments about emotional claims all the time. A number of years ago, while teaching in the religion department of a college, I had a student who experienced mental illness. By participating in a counseling program and by taking medication, he was able to remain in school. But unfortunately, he came under the influence of charismatic religious community who convinced him his condition was caused by demon possession. That possession these people argued, were perpetuated by his willingness to trust the secular medical community rather than God. Under their direction, he stopped seeing his therapist, caused his, ceased his medication, and underwent exorcism at the hands of the group leader. Only a short while later, one bitterly cold winter night, he was reading the Bible in order to discern the leading of the Spirit. He came across Paul's words, Walk in the Spirit, Galatians 5.16, as they are translated in the King James Version. Feeling that to be God's directive, he set out on foot in near zero weather for his girlfriend's home some eighty miles distance, singing hymns and stopping at farm homes along the way, in order to tell their inhabitants that the end of the world was near at hand. Police finally picked him up and brought him to a psychiatric ward of a hospital, where he began a slow, torturous process back to some emotional stability. It's a tragic story, and certainly an obvious case of confusion about what the Holy Spirit means. But the clear lesson is that life in the Spirit is not irrational, and it does not contradict sound human understanding about how we in the world are put together. To pit life in the Spirit against theology is dangerous.
It leaves us open to confusing the true nature of the spirit with all sorts of nonsense, superstition, prejudice, and even, as this story demonstrates, mental illness. Life in the spirit must be coherent, not with some special Christian version of rationality, but with a reasonableness that can be recognized by all human beings. This should be no surprise. Christians believe that God is the author of the world, and all that is in it. And that includes human intelligence and understanding. Just as you cannot find life in Christ merely by thinking carefully or by studying theology, so you are foolish to believe that it ignores or contradicts our natural capacities for rational, for thinking rationally. Thomas Aquinas, the great theologian of the Middle Ages, puts it this way, Grace does not destroy nature, but rather fulfills it. God's unique self-communication does not contradict human knowledge of reality. It is the task of theology to investigate just where and how the coherent between the truth of Christ and the truth of human rationality can be discovered. In doing this, the care and discipline that Christians are expected to exercise is not meaning to be arid or bloodless. Theology is not detached thinking. It is believing thinking. It is faith-seeking understanding, as another medieval th theologian Anselm of Canterbury put it, at heart it should be a form of love. Yes, love. Living theology wants to express what it means to love God, not only, only with all one's heart and with all one's soul and with all one's strength, but also with all one's mind. See Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Mark twelve thirty, and Luke ten twenty seven. Sometimes it is hard to see. But it really is theology's deepest motivation. Reading Thomas Aquino's work, great work, Summa Theologiae, is like reading an exercise in abstract philosophical argument. He sets up thesis and then examines arguments for and then against, and finally draws rationally coherent conclusions. He cites Aristotle more than he does scripture, and his commitment to logic is dispassionate. But at the time he was writing his theology, Thomas was having mystical visions in the chapel, and one day he had a vision of Christ appear and say to him about his rationally rigorous book, Thomas, you have written well of me. That's because, for Thomas, loving the truth is loving God, and serving the cause of discovering the intelligibility of Christian faith is serving Christ. Theology is not meant to displace life in the spirit, rather it is meant to grow out of it and to clarify what life means. When theology is arid and dull and irrelevant, it no longer serves the spirit, or is a vehicle for the spirit, but then it no longer serves the cause of intelligibility either. Seeking to make sense of the faith entails discerning how it speaks to and intersects with the scope and depth of human experience and insight. Such commitment enables theology to serve God and express love for God, and it ends up creating exciting theology. Summary We never read the Bible in a vacuum. Consequently, we need to be conscious and reflective about the precipice presuppositions that determine how we interpret it, prioritize its contents, and sort out questions about it. No one escapes using the Bible without looking for some guidance or authority from outside its pages, even if this is done unconsciously. We need to do this honestly and openly and be held accountable for the appeals we make. All of this is essential if we are to let the Bible speak on its own terms, instead of having our reading merely reflect the views we project into it. By doing careful and informed theology, we respect the Bible's authority by examining our own presupp presuppositions. It's true that it is God's Spirit and not theology that is foundational for our life in Christ, but eventually we need to be clear about what the Spirit is and isn't. There are misguided and even destructive, destructive enthusiasms and commitments. To pit the spirit against theology is dangerous. It leaves the door open to all sorts of nonsense, prejudice, and emotionally ill claims. Scripture associates God's spirit with intelligibility. At rock bottom, theology is not bloodless intellectualizing. It is living out the commitment to love God with all one's mind. Living theology grows out of life in the spirit. For further reading and reflection, it is important that you begin to become familiar with the technical language of theology. An invaluable resource is a theological dictionary. I suggest that you buy one right now and use it consistently, particularly in these early phases of your theological study. Theological dictionaries are never neutral. Not only the definitions that are provided, but even the topics that are selected always reflect the theological commitments and biases of the 
I lost my place, of the editors and authors. I will make some notes about that factor below. Some ti titles you might want to consider are Concise Dictionary of the Christian Tradition, Concise Dictionary of Evangelical Theology, A Pocket Catholic Dictionary, The New Dictionary of Theology, Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms, A New Handbook of Christian Theology, A Concise Dictionary of Theology. Continuing, Dictionary of Feminist Theology, two very helpful resources that are out of print, but that are worth tracking down in used bookstores or, li or libraries, are a Handbook of Christian Theology and a Handbook of Theological Terms. Because scripture is so basic to Christian theology, and even more so to Christian worship and devotional life, students should make extra effort to become acquainted with some of the assumptions, goals, and patterns of academic biblical scholarship. Broadly speaking, the biblical scholarship that shapes the life of mainstream Protestant, evangelical, conservative, Protestant, and Roman Catholic communities is increasingly an interchangeable and shared enterprise. It is not surprising, for example, to find Protestant scholars who are members of the Catholic Biblical Association or Roman Catholics who are leading figures in the Society of Biblical Literature, which has Protestant roots. In fact, there is a full mix of people in the academic arena, including surprising as it may seem, New Testament scholars who are Jewish and biblical scholars who are not participants in any religious community. The fundamental criterion is not whether or not a scholar's views are orthodox from any particular perspective, but rather if they are intellectually defensible. The patterns of scholarly inquiry into the collection of writings known as collectively as the Bible have an umbrella term biblical criticism. The term criticism does not have the negative connotation it has in popular usage, but indicates scholarly analysis. It indicates a careful examination of the writings contained in the Bible, which is an integral part of the work of attempting to understand the wider world through disciplined reflection. Donald McKim defines biblical criticism as the study and investigation of biblical writings through many means to understand elements such as their backgrounds, forms, history, authorship, audience, message, language, circumstances, and relation to other biblical writings. He also goes on to give brief definitions of most of the sub-disciplines of biblical study. Even when people don't necessarily recognize the need to integrate scripture with so-called secular knowledge, they are constantly doing so, even in half-conscious and confused ways. For example, one can often hear church people making the argument that the six days of creation mentioned in the first chapter of Genesis really refer to indeterminate periods of time, not six successive 24-hour days, but the text says no such thing. This raises some interesting questions. Where do people get the warrant for reading the words of Scripture in ways that the text itself does not suggest? What would prompt people to interpret the text this way? Is this anything more than a purely arbitrary point of view? Theology consciously aims to get beyond mere opinion or undergrounded assertions. As with this text in Genesis, or with any and all religious assertions, it aims at ha having us become self-conscious and responsible for our views. It asks us to become aware of our assumptions, put them on the table, examine them carefully, and see if they can be justified. The process can seem intimidating, but it also enables us to discover an understanding of religious matters that can have measures of intellectual grounding and vindication. <laughs>